Well, we will go ahead and get started now. Thank you all so much for tuning in today. I'm really excited to dive into this incredible office hours session. So first off, a bit of background information on our esteemed host. Alexa is a creative brand strategist focused on eco consulting. Her interdisciplinary approach uses business as a tool to create positive cultural impact. She is passionate about empowering brands to bridge impact design and eco innovation. She is also the founder of Trash Talk Studio, it's a tongue twister, and the co-founder of Literally, a mobile dance trash pickup party that began in the streets of New York City. And I think that's just the best thing I've ever heard. So thank you so much, Alexa, for taking the time to teach us about your expertise today. We know how valuable your time is, and we can't wait to learn from you today. Mm, I'm so, so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. And welcome, Lori, who's just joining. Wonderful. So, I mean, Hannah, I think you you gave a, a really good introduction about me. Um, but basically, just to like give you a little bit more context, like my background is in design and business strategy, but I've always been really passionate about the environment and really about like finding very creative ways to engage with the environmental conversation. For me, like the current environmental rhetoric feels like it has so much missing, you know? And like a lot of that is like the creativity, the inspiration, like how can we like approach things in a way that's exciting? So hence literally like why not dance and pick up trash, <laughs> you know? And like, that's a lot of the work that I do with my clients as well, or the people that I work with. And like really trying to push the boundaries of how we understand environmentalism and make it something that we're excited about and want to engage with. Because at the end of the day, like it is a really daunting topic. It can be really, really overwhelming, particularly like when we first start learning about all of these issues and how they're interconnected and so ingrained in like our everyday life and our systems, like it can be really paralyzing. You know, and like sometimes the approach is to like have all of these like facts of everything that's going wrong and like the degrees that the earth is warming and like the amount of deforestation we're seeing, which is super, super important. But at the end of the day, like we need more than a vision of doom. Like we need more than to just be scared shitless. <laughs> um, so this is why I started Trash Talk to really offer a very different and fresh perspective to the environmental crisis, how it relates to our lives, how it relates to us as creatives, makers, humans, and beyond. So I actually want to start off by asking the room, and you can unmute yourself and just like give us a little bit of context. I, I'd love to learn what your associations are with the environmental crisis, sustainability, the whole idea of like going green, like what does it bring up for you? Like what are your, <laughs> the things that you associate with it? And most importantly, like how does it make you feel? For me, um, I feel very small and I feel like these issues are so big and sometimes I feel like, oh, I'm using a reusable bag today. But like, is that actually doing something? So I guess kind of like the struggle of like, how much can I really do? And how can we get more people on board to make an impact? Awesome. We'll definitely get into a little bit of that, Tana. Lauren dropped in the chat, sometimes overwhelmed. Absolutely. Yeah. Understandable. I feel like that all the time as well. There's my dog. Teresa, did you have any thoughts? No worries, if not. Wonderful. Lori, anything that you want to share? Okay, wonderful. We'll go ahead and get started and just be prepared that there will be moments in this presentation where I will be asking questions. So feel feel free to participate. I highly encourage it. Can everyone see my screen properly? Yeah, okay, wonderful. So one of the things that I find the most fascinating 
about the environmental crisis and about Ooh. oh no worries Teresa it's perfect <laughs> if you want to turn off your video if that makes it better then that's perfect yeah okay wonderful so one of the things that I find the most fascinating about the environmental crisis and the way that we live today is actually that we live in a culture where we are so connected to each other through technology. We can, in two seconds, like pick up our phones and look at what's happening on the other side of the world, connect with family members that live in a completely different continent. Like in some ways, the modern world has allowed us to be connected in this remarkable way. But at the same time, we've become so incredibly disconnected from the objects that surround us. Most of us rarely pay attention to all of these little objects that sustain our modern urban lives. And we have learned to see them as something that's disposable or even not there. And there, there's many reasons like within the qualities of plastic itself, you know, like how cheap it is, how light it is, how transparent it is, you know, like we have, it's the first material that we actually have trained ourselves to unsee, which is absolutely wild. So I want you to humor me for a second and think about something that you know is bad for the environment, but use anyways. And you can look around you for inspiration. <laughs> it might be like um, your clothes even. Um, or you might be thinking about something completely different, but what I want you to do is start to form a very, very clear picture of it in your mind. Does everyone have an object? Um, definitely when you said clothes, that definitely stands out to me. It's something that I like don't really think about until I'm like made aware of it. Um, and then also just like plastic in general, there's just like, it's amazing how quick like my trash fills up with like food packages, um, toiletries, things like that. It's just pretty crazy. And it's again, the feeling of like, oh my gosh, there's so much plastic. How do I even begin to start reducing this? It's just like in every single aspect of my life, there's just so much. Awesome. Well, pick one in particular, Hannah, the, the one that you're like, oh, I just can't stop using this. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Lauren's Lauren's well. I'm going to take you through a little guided exercise. So humor me for a second and close your eyes. And take a deep inhale and a deep exhale. And then just start connecting to your own body for a second. Notice the place where the air comes into your nose and the place where it comes out and take a few deep breaths. Release any tension that you might be holding. Make sure that your spine is straight, shoulders relaxed. And now begin to bring this object back into your mind and imagine that you're holding it in your hands. And just get really, really specific with this object, begin to notice the size, the texture, the shape. Imagine that you're playing around with it with your hands, that you're really, really trying to understand what it is as if you've never seen it before. And get really, really curious. And now imagine that you're bringing this object up to your ears and you continue playing around with it and what is it saying? What can you hear? What does it sound like? And then you continue playing with it and maybe you get really curious and you bring it up to your nose. What does it smell like? And now just begin to think about what this object is beyond what it does for you. What are its materials? Where does it come from? How many countries has it passed through? How many hands? How many machines? How far has it traveled to get to you? And 
And now begin to imagine what happens to it after its time with you is done. When we say we're going to throw something away, where is a way? And just ponder on this for a second. How connected do you feel to this object? How close or disconnected do you feel to it? And take another deep breath. And as you're ready, begin to open your eyes. So let's take plastic as an example here. Plastic fibers are found in 83% of the world's tap water. In bottled water, that number is 90%. So if you drink, pla if you drink water, you have plastic inside you. And this is mind blowing in the sense that a way is not only here on this planet, a way is actually inside us. We shape our tools and then our tools shape us. And this, in this case, it's taken to an extreme because these objects and systems that we have created to sustain our lives are actually changing us in the like deepest, like physiological way. So, What's interesting to observe here is that the way that we, the way that we relate to this, these objects, they, the way that we're taught to interact with them as something that's completely disposable is completely disconnected from the reality of the world in which these things live. You know, we've been taught to think about oh, we throw something away and then go, someone takes care of it or it somehow disappears into space. And I think we've really, really started to see the impacts only recently of like all of this plastic ending up in beaches and inside animals and now like even inside us. <laughs> and we're like, oh, okay. <laughs> Maybe this isn't a, a system that is as efficient as we thought. You know, and like, these are some of the things that at the end of the day, like it's this cultural myth of separation of like mind is separate from body. I am separate from you. And we are most definitely separate from nature, which really prevent us from actually understanding the reality of the world that we live in. So the question that I ask here is how might we begin to realign our perceived separation with the inherent reality of how interconnected we are, not only to nature and the world, but to all of these things that we consider disposable or that we throw away. Because at the end of the day, everything that we return to the earth will come back to us. So what I'm going to present to you here and like what we're going to go into is really a framework for having regenerative discussions about our role as makers, consumers, and humans in the face of the environmental crisis. So this is not the solution. It's one of many approaches of how to look at it that really pushes us to get a little bit more curious and approach this issue like five layers deeper than the usual conversation and really examining like what are the values, the stories, the culture that has gotten us to the place that we are today and what are the alternatives? Like how can we really begin to explore this from a different place and get really curious about what we can do about it? So the next question that I'm going to throw out to you is do humans dominate nature? What are the thoughts? Feel free to unmute yourself or, or drop it in the chat. I feel like humans want to believe we dominate nature. I don't necessarily know if we like actually have the capability to dominate, especially in terms of like 
natural disasters or things like that that we really can't control, um, I don't think. So, yeah. I, I definitely think like Hannah that humans um, want to dominate nature. I don't know if consciously or unconsciously, but we have we have trusted and believed that we are the kings of the earth. And then now we are seeing the consequences. Yeah, yeah. these are two, two very good points. Hannah, what's being uh, typed in the chat? Oh, yes, sorry. <laughs> um, Lori said, I think this year is a great lesson that we don't dominate nature. Yeah, yeah. COVID is a perfect example, you know, like I, I've gotten really curious about even the rhetoric of um, making the virus the enemy, you know, and it's like, huh, like how can we like really look at this in a different way? Like even like knock on wood that this vaccine works, but there's this idea of like control, you know, and like, we are great and we're going to like control this and like make it okay and like make it work for us so that we can go back to to normal and and i think for a lot of us this has actually brought a slowing down and having to like stop what we're doing has brought about a lot of reflection around like where are we going i was just having this conversation with hannah you know like how do i actually want to live my life and on a bigger scale like where do we want to go from here so this is actually a question that like, I, I don't think we ask ourselves enough, yet it is one of the underlying myths of how we have built our civilization. Like it's woven into everything that we've done and like how we continue this process of trying to emancipate ourselves from nature and actually dominate the earth. And we see it in the processes of mass extinction that are happening right now. Like we're actually in a time that's called the sixth mass extinction. And it's actually caused by humans, by crazy deforestation, fossil fuels, warming temperatures and beyond. And at the end of the day, like modern civilization has brought us amazing things like this. And at the same time, like it has come with consequences like pollution or things like this. And the reason why that is happening is that we have modeled our society to have the human at the center of everything. We have, we have literally like acted and created a society, an economy, a value system that is all surrounding the human. You know, where like every single thing in nature is considered a natural resource that we can just take and use for our own pleasure without considering the importance of biodiversity and life and other animals eating. And it's really interesting because there's a lot of people that use the um, Darwin's uh, law, <laughs> law of the survival of the fittest. But at the end of the day, like if you actually look at, at how nature works, like yes, animals do kill each other and eat each other and all these things, but they never take more than they need. And humans are actually the first species ever that have taken way more than we need. We have continued extracting and extracting and extracting from the earth because in our mind and in our cultural story, we are the center of everything and we are separate from nature. We don't actually need nature to survive, which I think right now is becoming a little bit more, more obvious that, that we do. We actually need to change the relationship that we have to us, not the natural world and natural system. And even a little bit beyond that, understand that we are nature too. <laughs> You know, and everything that we do to nature, we do to ourselves. But obviously, if we have the thought of like, we are at the center and everything is here to serve us, or there obviously is no such thing in business as you can have things in business like business externalities, you know, and like companies can produce waste and not be responsible for it. So this is, this is like a little bit of the root. And I really love this quote by modern philosopher Alain de Botton, which is, 
the thing about modern society and why it causes us anxiety is that we have nothing at its center that is non-human. We are the first society to be living in a world where we don't worship anything other than ourselves. And in a way, like if you think about it, all our humans are human heroes and like, yes, we're great, but we have completely lost a sense of reverence for life itself. Like we have forgotten that every single breath that we take comes from the oceans, from these little creatures called phytoplankton that like most of us don't even know exist. And we have really forgotten that life itself is sacred. You know, like being able to have this experience on this planet is like such a miracle. And like, it's incredible that we are part of this mystery. But what if the way that we live is not the only way to live? And this thought is really exciting to me. And one of the other stories that exists in the world today, which is a little bit less prominent in modern urban societies, but it is another way to understand the world and I find very interesting and I'll tell it through a personal anecdote. This guy's name is Edwin and I met Edwin when I went to the Amazon jungle for the first time. Um, I was working in Peru at the time and my boss recommended <laughs> that I go to the Amazon jungle and I was like, oh yeah, I'll go. <laughs> for a weekend alone and little did I know that it was going to change my life and the thing about this trip and meeting Edwin was that Edwin grew up in a jungle town of 120 people and as we were walking through the forest like he had a way of knowing and understanding the jungle and the world that I had never encountered before and what was so surprising about the way that Edwin understood the world was that he knew every single plant, animal, fungi, everything that existed in the jungle. But he not only knew what every single thing did, they knew how he knew how everything worked in relationship to each other. So if there was a plant here that was poisonous, then he knew exactly like this other plant that was a remedy. Or like, if you wanted uh, water, this one was the one and like, but you had to like filter it with this other thing, <laughs> you know, and like, it was just like such a wild understanding of relationships. And that was the moment that really led me to question like, why isn't our world built like that? You know, like, why is it that we understand um, agriculture as something that's completely separate from healthcare, you know, like, at the end of the day, if you like really think about it, if we invested more in like having access to healthy, nutritious food that's like regenerating the soil, then like we would have to, we would be spending so much less money on healthcare because people wouldn't be sick from the food that we're eating. So like that's the moment where I really started to connect the dots of like, oh wow, like there is another way to understand the world. That's completely different from anything that we have ever known. And it's actually so much more accurate to how the world actually works because this worldview of life actually understands that we are part of this system. This story of the world recognizes that there is no way, you know, like we are in this closed loop system where we are continuously in conversation with the world. Like every single breath that I take, I'm having a conversation with the oceans, even though I'm nowhere near the ocean. And that's kind of mind blowing to think, you know, like every single object that I use and interact with comes from the natural world. Like even this laptop that I'm giving this conversation from comes from nature. Like at the end of the day, everything is nature, including us. And it, it's so wonderful to be able to observe it from this like systems. We are part of it because we belong to it as much as it belongs to us, you know, and I think it's really, really important that as a human society, we remember that we are part of a mystery and part of something that's so much greater than us as human beings. And some other useful ways to think about this idea of ecological empathy, because I think at the end of the day, it does come to that. It comes to, uh, to 
coming out of this numbing that we've been in, that, that society has, has built into a lot of us and really start to become more sensitive and more conscious to all of these things around us. And one of the things, ways to think about it that, that I think is really important is that it's not a binary. It's not like you're either an environmentalist or you're not. You know, it's such a process of understanding and connecting and learning and then forgetting and then remembering. And I would actually say that the majority of people are in this place where they are passively aware <laughs> or are becoming a little bit more actively aware in the way that they're engaging with things. However, I do recognize that there's a lot of barriers to this process. Um, these are some of the top ones. I think language is a huge one. Like in, in the one hand, like the way that we talk about it, products being sustainable or everything is green, you know, and like, we have no idea what those things even mean with like all of the lobbying that has gone on in the background and like these terms become so confusing to us sometimes. And then on the other hand, like a lot of the conversation is based on war metaphors, you know, like the war against climate change and we're fighting and it's so anti, <laughs> you know, and like it perpetuates this idea of nature being separate to us. So how are we actually gonna bridge that disconnection if we're like fighting against something when at the end of the day, it's so much more about reconnecting. Then, I mean, lack of exposure in, at, in this day and age, I think it's like complete denial. <laughs> Another huge one is convenience. At the end of the day, like, it is very conven convenient to not be sustainable because those are the options that are available. And there's, of course, identity politics, you know, like not being able to like visualize yourself as a vegan or as someone who is zero waste. And like, it seems like such a jump to like, think about this of like, I'm either a vegan or I'm not, you know, or like it's, it can be so intimidating to like really think about yourself in a completely new way that you never imagined. Um, then there's obviously like staying in our comfort zones. Like it can be really comfortable to not look at this. Also as adults, it's so difficult to accept that we don't know, you know, like being in a completely beginner's mind where you're like, I'm going to learn about this. I'm going to like uh, start exploring something where like, I'm not an expert. It can be really, really intimidating. Another huge one is not having a support system. And like, I, I remember when I met my business partner for literally Lauren that Hannah was just in a, in a call with. And one of the things that we bonded over was how uncomfortable it was to be the only person in your friend group that didn't want to order delivery because of the waste, you know, and like how awkward it can be to have those conversations where some of the people around you are just like not on board and you're making life a little bit more inconvenient for them. Like we don't want to be the, the preachy one. <laughs> that's like, you shouldn't do that, blah, 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 blah. And that's not the approach I'm, I'm suggesting one takes, but I think it is a reality in this process. <laughs> that's important to acknowledge. So um, another important tool of like how I have learned to think about this, and this is basically like whenever I create a, uh, a project or do work with with people or brands around this i really like to make these distinctions of how important it is to think about the emotional understanding over the intellectual understanding um, it's actually been proving that as children and as we continue to grow up we learn through our bodies and through our emotions and sometimes we have certain emotional imprints that can be so much more like inherent to how we um, <laughs> relate to the world and how we act within it than just being given a bunch of information. Like if I were just to tell you like uh, only 9% of trash uh, of plastic that has ever been created is recycled, your experience with that fact is gonna be a lot less uh, profound than if you go to a dancing trash pickup party <laughs> or any trash pickup party where you're actually interacting with the thing and you have this moment of like, oh shit, like this is disgusting, you know, and, and it smells bad. And like, you actually have a tangible experience with the thing. 
also intrinsic versus external motivators. Like we are so much more likely to do something if we deeply believe in it than if someone tells us like, that is what you have to do when it becomes really prescriptive. And it can be a really off-putting thing in some environmental circles where I'm like, I know better than you and like blah, 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 versus like, I actually really believe this and understand like why I'm taking certain actions in my life. There's also the physical versus the rational experience. And I think this is very connected to the emotional understanding piece of like actually like having an, an experience, you know, and I think a lot of people, for, for example, who live in California have had this experience recently with the wildfires where it's like a rough wake up call of actually living through that. Then there's the perspective versus the behavior drivers and also the active versus passive exploration. And I think that this, this element is really, really important of like not only being intellectually aware of something, but actually doing it and experimenting it and living it and breathing it in your own life gives you a completely different experience. And at the end of the day, it all comes down to connection. And it's about connecting to ourselves, connecting to others, and connecting to the environment. And I actually think that these three elements are completely interrelated. Like, I, I would actually say that in the environmentalism at its like most fundamental on its most fundamental level it's is actually self love it's like taking care of yourself and it's so much better if you do it in community you know like if we're able to understand that we are so much bigger than ourselves and if we take care of ourselves so that we can take care of others and we actually continue extending that outward so how might we help humans feel more connected to ourselves, to others, and to the environment? And I want to em emphasize feeling because it is really important that there is this like more emotional aspect to it. And what I, I, what I have come to after many, many years of this work and exploration is actually mindfulness. I think it actually starts with learning to pay attention to all of these details that we have forgotten about in the fast pace of our lives, of slowing down enough so that we can take a moment in the morning and take in a ray of sunshine, you know, and like, remember that it's crazy, like, that if the sun was a little bit hotter or a little bit colder, like, the conditions for life on earth might not even be possible, you know, and just like having these moments of like deep, deep reverence and like remembering of the beauty of all of these little tiny details and you know like stopping before a meal to like think like oh like where did this come from you know like be grateful for the soil that grew it for the farmers for the entire process of like having food on your plate and this thing that nourishes you and like literally becomes you you know and it's like in some ways, it's so much simpler than we think. We look at this big problem and it sounds like it's very up here and it's actually a lot more simple and, and a lot more grounded than we think. So when you were saying, Hannah, like, does it even matter if I'm doing this thing and if I'm like <laughs> making all these changes? Like, absolutely, it does on, on the level that like, if you're putting this intention towards it, you're actually changing your consciousness. And I think it's a little bit like meditation of like, you're literally rewiring your brain through putting your attention and your intention into the way that you're doing things, into just like taking a moment to take a breath or make a more intentional purchase at the supermarket, you know, or like go a step further and like order a CSA or like go to the farmer's market. Like, I think it's so easy to fall into this idea of like, we need to do everything and it's so big and we can't do everything and blah, 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 blah. And I actually think that these little, little moments are the most important thing that we can do. And obviously like work with companies and governments and like make all of these like larger systemic changes that are obviously necessary. But at the end of the day, like it starts with us. So I will ask you to take a moment to set an intention for yourself and make sure that it's something 
small manage manageable that you can keep coming back to for at least a week or however long you want to. And it can be around taking a breath in the morning or like spending some time in the sun or something around your food or your waste consumption. And I'll just give you a few minutes to, to think about it. We can actually close our eyes and just visualize how making that change will feel in your body and in your life. After you've committed to doing this thing, how will you be more inspired by yourself? How will you inspire others? Or how might this actually like make little ripples of change that you might not even see? And take a deep breath into that and open your eyes. And I'm just gonna leave you with this quote from one of my favorite books, Ishmael by Daniel Quinn, which is that stopping pollution is not inspiring. <laughs> Sorting your trash is not inspiring. Cutting down on flu fluorocarbons <laughs> is not inspiring, but this, Thinking of ourselves in a new way, thinking of the world in a new way, well, that is really something. Thank you. And I'm going to open it up to questions if anyone wants to ask anything. This was amazing. <laughs> we'll have the questions coming. I just want to say this was so. I never thought I could feel so deeply about like thinking about trash or like feeling connected to the piece of plastic I was thinking of in that first exercise. Like it was just really profound. Mm, and that's so awesome. I always say that um, trash is like a gateway drug. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. I love the idea of the interconnection. I had never thought about it in this way and it's really powerful. And thank you. All right. Well, if there are no further questions, we can go ahead and wrap up. Thank you so much, Alexa, for taking the time to just really enlighten us on this important topic. And also, I loved how you know, this, this presentation was not like a solution of how we can fix everything. And I, I really love that because it's not just one quick fix. You know, it's like you said, mindfulness day in and day out with each of our decisions. So thank you so much. This was very refreshing and I just feel really energized to, you know, take those little steps each day. It, it was such a pleasure. And like, I just want to say that it's such a practice. Like it, it really is like, it requires a lot of commitment and devotion, but it really does wonders. I think like for my own life, there were so many, like I, I've experimented with it in so many different ways, like it was like reducing my waist. And then suddenly I realized like my body felt so much better and like my skin was completely clear. And I was like, oh, wow, <laughs> like eating seasonally and locally is great. <laughs> Yeah. So it does have all of these like unexpected uh, little things that will surprise you. And I think everyone's journey is different, but I, I highly encourage you to, to give it a try. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone who tuned in. It's always such a treat to learn alongside you. Um, I hope you all have an amazing rest of your day and hopefully I'll see you on a future call very soon. Thank you, Hannah. Bye-bye. Thank you.